Hello and welcome to another episode of the UK Sailmakers Lessons Learned podcast series, where we interview incredible sailors who share their stories and tips to help you sail with confidence. I'm your host, Brendan Huffman from UK Sailmakers Los Angeles. Today, I am joined by Christian Williams, who not only has an impressive sailing resume, including three solo trips to Hawaii and back to Los Angeles, but he's also an author, a former editor at the Washington Post, as well as a TV writer and producer. Welcome, Christian, and thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Hi, Brendan. So I'd like to start with your three solo trips to Hawaii and back um, aboard your Ericsson 38. This is your second Ericsson, and I'm interested why you selected this boat and then came back to buy a larger Ericsson for your next two trips. Yeah, I'd like to know the answer too. <laughs> you know, I, I the first trip was in the 32.3, which is a marvelous Ericsson, it sells like a dinghy. And when I got back, I promptly put it up for sale. And uh, so I'm never doing that again. That was really uncomfortable. So within moments, a guy appeared with a checkbook and trucked it to Seattle. And I looked at the hole in the water that was my slip at the California Lock Club and thought, what have I done? <laughs> so I then uh, went looking for another Ericsson and found a 38. And the second two voyages were in that boat. What is it about the layout? Um, that you like and the way the boat handles, especially for single-handed sailing? Well, you know, I grew up uh, as a young man. My father raced uh, Newark offshore trimarans. He had two built by Dick and Maine. And and so we did five multi hull Bermuda races on those. Even in the, in, in the 70s and the 80s, we were going 25 knots downwind. And, and Ericsson goes 6.491 knots. If you do everything right, it'll surf to 7.66 knots if you do everything right. And it turns out that I prefer that to going really, really fast and not sleeping very well. What drew me to Ericsson's was the hull form. If you look at a Bruce Kirby design hanging in a sling, as I did with the 32.3, it touches every aspect of yachting beauty, in my opinion. I mean, Bruce King is well-known as a designer who puts uh, aesthetics first. And when you look into uh, any of the Ericsson's of the 80s, it's like entering a teak forest. I don't know, you can't do it anymore. The joinery and and uh, boats like that, um, even if you dig down to the back of the quarter berth, some boat carpenter has made beautiful mitered joints and all the bronze screws are plugged, even where you'll never see them. So those are very attractive to me. And, you know, it's just another well-made production sailboat of the 80s. But they do the things I like to do well, go to Windward for one thing. And I think it's mostly an aesthetic choice rather than a comfort choice. I agree. I like uh, the cabin windows. There's kind of an Ericsson trademark. Yeah. Uh, two aft windows on the cabin side that right. look um, traditional, but but classy at the same time. So when you're single handing, well, sailing to Hawaii from Southern California, you start off close hauled and tight reaching. And I assume that's the experience you had unless you took a dip south uh, for more comfort and to get in the trade sooner. W which way did you, did you uh, change that up each time or did you pretty much sail a direct course? No, it's very exciting from L.A. I leave Catalina Island to port, and that's the last land you see until you get there. And you're right, uh, because of the way the uh, currents and the winds come down the coast, it's a very close reach for the first couple of days. You've done this. Um, and it's cold and it's wet. And if you're going to get seasick, it's a good time to get seasick. But after a week or so, the wind comes aft, and you eventually get to almost dead downwind. It's not a milk run, but the thing that I like about cruising is to arrive at a tropical, warm destination with changes in the weather. It's the same uh, sailing to Bermuda. You leave the New York or Newport area, and it's gray, and the water, uh, the continental shelf water is green, and you sail out about 170 miles shivering in your fellow weather gear and your sea boots. 
and then you cross the Gulf Stream, you get a little seasick, and suddenly, wham, you're in the Bermuda High, there's a blue sky, the water is 85 degrees and crystal clear. You know, I'm from Brooklyn and New Jersey. To me, it's all a miracle that anything could be this beautiful. Uh, and it's the same with the Hawaii trip. So, so setting out into the rather cold by California standards uh, um, initial leg, and then having it warmer and the flying fish appear um, is a spectacular reason to do it, I think. Christian, I've never done the Bermuda race and hardly anyone I know has on the West Coast. How does it compare to sailing to Hawaii? I know it's a shorter course, I believe 700 miles, but tell us what the difference is. Well, it's a kind of a preview of coming attractions for transatlantic or uh, the Hawaii run because it's short. You know, fast boats get there in three or four days. It's a real navigation challenge for racing. It's almost the same course from New York, Chesapeake, or Newport, 160, something like that. And it's characterized by cold continental shelf water. Then you go through the Gulf Stream, and uh, then there's no wind. And, and then you arrive at this island you can't see, unlike Hawaii, which is mountainous. And you could see it a long way out, it's surrounded by coral reefs. And you have to find the entrance at St. David's Head, Spit Boy, S P I T. Um, which is a little tiny thing. And then you're in paradise. You know, you've left city America, formerly British colony, where people wear these funny shorts and high socks, which as a kid, I immediately adopted Bermuda shorts and high socks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the difference is uh, mostly duration. The Gulf Stream is a wild, woolly crossing often if the seas oppose the current, which is three or four knots. Once when we crossed it, I, I tell you, without exaggeration, the waves were 25 feet high. They were so steep in the Gulf Stream that seaweed, sargasso weed, hung in them like pictures on a wall. I remember steering and looking up and seeing a wall of green water with, with decorations in it. Uh, you don't run into that on the way to Hawaii. The other major difference is, in my perspective anyway, uh, everybody leaves July 1st or in June to go to Hawaii. And um, characteristically, hurricanes form in Mexico, down around the equator and parallel your course to Hawaii. And uh, periodically, they also turn sharply northward. The one thing I'm uh, prepared to avoid in a small boat, especially alone, is a hurricane. It can ruin your day, your week, and everybody else's week, too. So um, you don't run into that with Bermuda, at least in the early sailing season. They're both wonderful experiences. Uh, Hawaii is much, much longer. Uh, it takes me almost three weeks to get there, usually, and at least three weeks to get back. The most amount of breeze I've ever seen on a race to Hawaii was 40 knots, but that was off of Northern California in Gale Alley. What's the most wind you saw on your trips to Hawaii? I, I have a theory that uh, there's a strange phenomenon out there. It's a fair weather gale, basically. And it blows 40, but the sea state is ordinary. And that just means reefing. Uh, it, you don't get 20 foot cresting waves. The biggest waves I've ever had to Hawaii or 12 feet, maybe cresting. The last time coming back, I had three days of gusting to 35 frequently. And I was under a jib alone much of the time. And I noticed that the seas were only 10, 12 feet, but it was a tight reach. But as you know, that means that you're paralleling the wave train. When they happen to crest against your boat, it's loud and, and wet, the wave just breaks over your boat. But I've been in three full gales, and uh, the Hawaii uh, trips have never approached anything like a full gale. Yeah, maybe uh, you'll see a squall where it's like that for an hour or so. In the evening, a line of squalls comes through from behind if you're sailing to Hawaii, and they blow th maybe 30 knots. So you go from 15 knots, and the sky darkens horrendously, like in a cartoon, and you think, wow, and here comes this squall, like a thunderstorm, but not as highly defined. 
and suddenly there are white caps behind you. Wait a minute, on top of the wave, thing overwhelms you with cold rain pellets, and it's gone in 20 minutes. The rain flattens the sea surface so that you're in this suspended animation where your boat's going hull speed. There's all kinds of wind, and yet it's quiet. It's the most remarkable experience. I've experienced the same things, just the magic of those nighttime squalls coming and you're alone on the water. Speaking of squalls, Christian, you know, in Southern California, we get to bump into people like John Jordan, who I think is up to 70 crossings to Hawaii or back. Right. And he's been doing this since the 60s, and he's an international authority on weather and meteorology. And he said that the squalls are more powerful today than they were 30, 40 years ago. And I thought that was an interesting observation he made and obviously keeps track of these things. I don't know if you've um, done enough trips to Hawaii to notice that or have heard that from others. I've heard it and it has actually given me a concern. I like to have an out in sailing, but whatever the cause, global warming, let's call it, El Nino cycles that are so different now for us in Southern California have taken away the predictability of this trip for me. The answer for me was a Jordan series drogue. If you do have the bad luck to get run over by a Mack truck, you know, called Hurricane Linda or something, you remove all sail, blast the helm, deploy the Jordan series drogue and go below. And that gives me a lot of comfort. That's the out. Yeah. And that's what the books say to do too. So back to single-handed sailing, what is the allure? You're not a hermit here in Los Angeles. You're a social guy, um, but you're alone for three weeks um, on the way to Hawaii and then again on the way back. What is the appeal of that? Well, not to get all psychological on it. Life is a performance. Um, there's a wonderful book by a guy named Hofstetter uh, called I Am an Endless Loop in which he makes the point among others that we are feedback mechanisms. You know, you, you and I are chatting now, so I'm listening to you and then I respond to you in a loop version. I'm performing for you to not seem to be too much of an eccentric, you know, or, or as old as I really am. You know, I'm doing all the things people do socially to survive encounters with each other. And you're doing more or less the same thing. We're creatures of feedback of each other, which is, what society is made up of. But if you're alone, there's no loop. Mm -hmm. You have days to consider who you are. I mean, not that you want to. And what happens is, this is the appeal to me. You suddenly recognize how many people you know because they live in your memory. And um, without people asking you questions where you have to provide an answer, you are more able to find out how lucky you are to be alive. That's what I mean by inhabiting the universe. It sounds kind of touchy-feely, but most of us don't know who we are. And I've always liked to go off alone periodically and uh, be a tea bag, steep in my own hot water and see what's there. And it's not as disappointing and terrifying as one might think. You realize you just are somebody. I want to ask you, about uh, my colleague Oliver and how UK sailmakers helped prepare you for these trips to Hawaii. Oh, it's a terrible story. Uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I came to Oliver McCann, who with you runs UK sailmakers and Marie Del Rey, with a lot of preordained, uh, preconceived opinions based on long, long sailing experience and utter confidence in myself, which is my stock and trade. And Oliver talked me out of everything. He talked me into a high clue, Genoa which was just great for one guy offshore. Yeah. Don't want a deck sweeper. And he talked me into a very heavy, almost 10 ounce Dacron sails, which now have uh, 10,000 miles on them. It looked new. You know, I was broken young once. And uh, I mean, mail order sail would have been great for the boats that I've fixed up in my garage when the ATM machine had zero in it. And ATM machines have just been invented. But nowadays, it's crazy not to have a sailmaker of your own, uh, a sailmaker's rep who will come to the boat and measure and give you advice like you and Oliver have given me. Uh, uh, 
the relationship with the sale maker will really change some of your preconceived opinions because you guys, I mean, you know, you're salesmen, but us sailors, you know, we're sort of in our own bubble. And uh, a good sale maker can really, really help you with advice. That's one of my favorite things about the job, actually, is helping people prep their boats. Yeah. Going to Hawaii or, or down to Mexico. And yeah, we have, we always have those conversations about deck sweeper headsoles versus a higher clue. And we, it always comes down to, well, what point of sale are you going to be on 90% yeah. of the time? And what sale is going to work? Your last two boats have been named Thelonious, and there must be a jazz theme or a story in there. Tell me about that. To me, jazz music, the great American art form, is probably defined by improvisation. If you are, if it is midnight and you're cruising along far offshore and it's hot and sweaty and you put on round midnight, probably Thelonious Monk's best known tune, it seems quite right. But other people say, what? Jazz has nothing to do with sailing. Thelonious Monk, who everybody agrees was an innovative, remarkable composer jazz pianist with a lot of eccentricities. By the way, there's another boat I discovered to my astonishment named Thelonious. And this guy, this Frenchman, must have been a jazz fan too because his dinghy was named Sphere. And Sphere, S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, is Monk's middle name. So, you know, there are at least two lunatics who think Thelonious is a good name for a boat. I agree with you on jazz. I usually don't listen to music when I'm sailing because I like all my senses to be aware. But especially at night, um, there's nothing like a good jazz album in the background. I want to switch gears. Prior to your single-handed sailing adventures, you had raced with Ted Turner and even wrote his biography. Tell us what racing with Ted Turner was like during the 1979 Fastnet race. Yeah, uh, it was one of the great experiences in everybody's life who was there, who survived it. It was aboard Tenacious, correct? Uh, yeah. SNS 65, I think it was? Uh, six, uh, well, 61 feet overall, I think. Yeah. So when you do the Fastnet race, uh, you usually do the Admiral's Cup series before, which is a series of day races on the Solent. And uh, we did all those. And I think we had as many as 21 guys on this boat during these Admiral Cup round the boys races. And the, in the fast end, we had a crew of 17. It's a lot of people. Turner had a very eccentric approach to this. For one thing, maybe people don't know this, but when you win a lot of races, your crew is made up of guys who have flown in uh, in first class sometimes. Everybody who raced with Turner had to buy their own airline ticket. And we were very proud of it. We couldn't know everybody. The captain put together the crew and there were Belgians and Frenchmen and UVM lacrosse players. So he trained us during Admiral's Cup by yelling at us. Turner was uh, one of the most enjoyable hysterics I've ever met. I've had the fortune to uh, encounter and even get to know two or three billionaires in my time, and they're all nuts. But Ted, and yachting his emotions on his sleeve, and this displayed itself by um, yelling at everybody, telling them that they were no good at what they did. I was the main sheet trimmer most of the time, and uh, I was always getting fired. Williams, that's terrible. Get off there. Who, it's who will replace you, George? Get over there and ten, an hour later, George would be fired. Um, and you, you didn't ask why. It was just that he was training everybody in the different positions and seeing what they could do. And um, by the end of that week, we were a well-knit team who had been through sort of Marine Corps basic training with Ted. There's something about Turner that is uh, necessary to explain now, and it wasn't so much then. Turner was his ambition and crazy, as spontaneous as any eccentric millionaire ever was, with a high-pitched voice, and sometimes his pants were too short fashion-wise. But in the end, he was an honorable man. As crazy as he is, his heart was in the right place. It was a great adventure. 
we won that race on corrected time. Yeah, and hardly any boats finished because it was a full-on gale. Boats yeah, yeah right. the anemometer's got a 60 knots or something. I'm sure it blew 80 or 90 mm -hmm. sometimes. The seas were the biggest I've ever seen. So, you know, we still sat on the rail in the middle of this with our feet dangling over the side, like you do in a racing boat, six or seven of us. Um, <laughs> but the water's colder. <laughs> the water's colder, and the water's breaking over us. The waves were 25 or 30 feet, and you could see them in the distance coming. And you could see them start to crest, but they didn't just crest like regular ocean waves. They broke like an avalanche. It was like being in Switzerland and taking a train through the Alps with these snow-capped mountains on either side. And occasionally, the crest intercepted our course, and we all got doused in this, you know, 50-degree water. But for all his zany qualities, Turner was a really good skipper. Of course, money buys a lot of this stuff, but he could sail. Everybody liked sailing with Ted, but you had to expect to get yelled at a lot. I don't know that that would work today, but back in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of yellers, and a handful of them, you could tell, really loved their crew and were great sailors. A lot of them were just jerks <laughs> and would not be able to find a crew today. Uh, the name of your book, your biography of Ted Turner, by the way, is Lead, Follow, or Get Out of the Way. I want to make sure... Our listeners are aware of that book. So speaking of books, you already mentioned one. What are two or three books that you really like that you think inspire sailing? Oh, gosh. You know, the book I have on board all the time is Francis Tichester's first book called uh, Alone Across the Atlantic, mm -hmm. in which you encounter seven gales and uh, his steering gear doesn't work and it's wet all the time and he still goes to bed in his pajamas um from you know uh from england to uh, boston and my father gave me that book when i'm a depressed at sea i just open up that book at random and read a few paragraphs and i, I feel much better um the one everybody should start with is joshua slocum's single-handed passage alone around the world which mr slocum a nova scotian sharpie did i think to make money because the lecture tour circuit afterwards, you know, Mark Twain did this too, was very lucrative. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this uh, indubitable loner, Mr. Slocum, uh, got to meet the president of the United States who wanted to shake his hand. So he was quite famous at the turn of the century. But the book that goes with that, the one people might not have heard about, is written by his son, Victor Slocum. Victor was nine during the crazy adventures of his father not just sailing around the world, but delivering boats to South America, running guns and stuff. And Victor's parallel story to the autobiography is a fascinating cast of light uh, upon everything. I have, I think, three videos on my sailing channel in which I review, cite, or admire sailing books, if anybody cares. Uh, there's a playlist at Christian Williams Yachting on YouTube, which contains endless opinions on this topic. <laughs> I like that. By the way, your YouTube channel has a lot of great videos that I encourage people to, to check out. Before we go, I'd like to know if there are a couple takeaways uh, that you can share with our listeners about preparing a boat for an offshore solo adventure. What are one or two things that you think are perhaps overlooked by a lot of people? I think overlooked by some people is doing it at all. I mean, it's remarkable what the Coast Guard scratches their head when you have a cocktail with a Coast Guardsman. He said, you can't believe what's out there. A couple of years ago, a crew of four set out for Hawaii and after three days, they turned back. And as you know, turning back in, into the, it's not much fun because their water maker broke. Yeah. Uh, what? You didn't have enough water? You couldn't anticipate that a water maker might not function? If you're going to sail to Hawaii and you don't put a year of preparation in it, then you are cutting your chance of success in half. 
You know, there's a bizarre approach to sale, to passage making, that most of us don't have. 90% of people are well prepared. They ask around the other people who've done it. They make long lists. They spend an extraordinary amount of money having spare parts because that's what's done. But 10% of people are adventurers. They feel that it's not an adventure unless you're taking chances and you're sort of exposing yourself to a heroic challenge and you must just go and do it. Those are the people that wash up on the beach or are airlifted out by helicopters. Yeah, I think a year, I think a year of boat prep is about right. But I think a lot of people miss out on that. That's part of the adventure. That's part of the fun. But it's also a survival skill because the more work you put into your boat, as you've done, you learn how all the systems work and all the systems are necessary for a successful trip unless you've made the right preparations when something fails like a water maker, a whisker pole, two sails, refrigeration, <laughs> that kind of thing. Steering. And for single handers, you need some kind of self steering gear, which alone will take a year to think through and install and learn how to use. That's um, right. But you're right. Preparation is fun. And the best sailing is done just before you fall asleep. Uh, be just before you turn off the light, when you think through all the scenarios and you remember what you've done wrong and right in the past and apply them to the future. And it builds your confidence in yourself that you know how to do this. Well, Christian Williams, I want to thank you for sitting down with us today. Looking forward to watching more of your videos on your YouTube channel, especially the one you mentioned about the books. I also want to thank our listeners. And you can find more episodes of our Lessons Learned podcast in the how-to section of our website at UKSailmakers.com. Episodes are also streaming on our YouTube channel and are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. For UK Sailmakers, I'm Brendan Huffman, and I hope these lessons learned will help you sail with confidence.